Welcome everyone to the SBA show. Uh, we're going to be stepping up our content this year, which means you won't have to wait a month to learn about cool product suppliers and valuable information to help build high performance homes. Along yeah. with our monthly webinars, we're going to be rolling out additional episodes that we yeah. think will be great little educational top ups. So I'd like to welcome you all to yeah. episode one of the SBA show, How to Ace Passive House. Yeah. For those joining us for the first time, my name is Hamish White. White one of the founding members of Sustainable Builds Alliance and director of Sanctum Homes, and I'll be your host for this evening. In the spirit of reconciliation, we'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging and extend our respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people today. Uh, today, we are joined by three pretty heavy hitters in the Passive House space. Uh, we have Brian Guinan, Ben Maxa, and Marcus Strang. Brian Guinan is the director of iSmart Building Group, a company delivering high-performance custom residential homes with a heavy focus on Passive House and has over 30 years' experience in the industry in Europe, the US, and now here in Australia. Gee, Brian, your rap sheet is super long. Uh, Brian is a carpenter, registered building practitioner, certified passive house tradesperson, certified passive house consultant, accredited ACTMA air tightness tester, one of the directors of Sustainable Builders Alliance and the host of the famous Sustainable Builders Gap podcast. And if his life isn't busy enough, recently Brian has also been voted in as a board member to the Australian Passive House Association. Uh, but more importantly, Brian is a husband to a beautiful wife and a father to four incredibly children, uh, four incredible children. Ben Maxa is an established Maxa design in 2004 and has developed the practice's reputation for leading edge sustainable design excellence. The studio specializes in high level eco and energy efficient homes built to brief and budget with creativity, practical can do approach and a singular dedication to creating the best possible outcomes for every client and every project. Maxa Design has twice been awarded Design of the Year, demonstrating that high performance and sustainable homes can also be beautiful. Ben is actively involved in the building design community and is a past member of the Committee of Management for Design Matters National. Ben regularly presents to professionals and advocates for eco homes designed for the broader community. Ben was also a judge in the 2007 BDAV Design Awards. He's a registered builder practitioner in every state of Australia and is a certified passive house designer. He's a father of two, husband of one, and spends, time cycling, spends more time cycling than he'd like to admit. And finally, Marcus Strang is a senior sustainability consultant at Hip First Height, working within their better buildings teams as a specialist in ultra-low energy building design. A former board member of the Australian Passive House Association, Marcus also led their technical working group and currently teaches a Passive House Designer course. Marcus, is most, Marcus most recently completed his PhD researching uh, pathways to net zero homes for mass timber buildings in hot and humid climates, presenting his findings at the World Conference on Timber Engineering in Oslo in 2023. Through his role as a Passive House Institute accredited certifier, and a certified passive house designer, Mark, Marcus has worked on a number of industry-leading sustainability projects across the public and private sectors. Marcus specialises in the passive house standard and mass timber design, which he sees as a fundamental step towards a net zero carbon emissions society. In this webinar, we're going to unpack how we can ace the passive house certification process from design through construction and all the way to installing the plaque in the front of the building. Um, there is going to be heaps to cover. We have a bunch of questions already, and we do apologise if we don't uh, get to all the questions. Um, today's webinar is brought to, brought to you by one of our platinum sponsors, Thermatech Windows and Doors. Uh, Thermatech make superior energy efficient new PVC windows and doors with advanced German technology, ideal for your sustainable build projects. Uh, check them out uh, on Instagram and also uh, their website. So today's webinar is going to be a roundtable Q&A. Um, as I said, we already have a bunch of questions, uh, but if you have any questions that you would like answered um, along the way, please pop them in the chat box down the bottom. 
Um, and maybe if we don't get to all of the questions, I might actually send them out to uh, Ben, Brian and Marcus uh, after the webinar. Uh, and maybe they could even use it as some content to answer those questions on their um, Instagram page. Ben, I know you've been pretty active on your Instagram lately. Maybe you can incorporate them into some of your uh, content. All right, uh, we're going to get stuck into it. So I'm just going to start firing questions at the guys and we're just going to start um, opening up a bunch of, uh, well, we're going to start opening up the discussion between the three guys. Um, as you can see from their bio, we've got some big brains in the room here when it comes to certify, certifying a building. So um, Marcus, I'm going to start with, uh, with, with one that I think is very much in your wheelhouse. Um, what are some typical thermal bridges that architects and designers generally ignore or forget about? I think yeah, thermal bridging is important to consider that as early as possible. Um, and generally, it can be left quite late. So that's especially when you have steel in the frame, still in the structure. Often during a design stage, we might not realize that's in the building at all. We, uh, we don't have the structural detailing for that. Um, and then it may just appear all of a sudden right towards the end of the design. So it's important to get those engineers involved really early, make sure we, we understand um, where the where the steel is, if we have steel and how we can mitigate it as much as possible, rather than it just appearing out of the blue um, towards the end of the design. Um, so yeah, definitely steel, um, inst installation of windows, that's a big one as well. And um, yeah, retrofitting projects. So if we're looking at retrofit projects, Often there's a lot of um, structure, maybe a brick wall that goes internal or um, many details, which we need to get that detailing and planning for, making sure that we're, we're looking at all these different junctions and assessing them all um, appropriately. Um, but yeah, I think that that would be the main ones that might get missed and we do need to yeah, make sure that we're considering them. So what I, what I am going to do is maybe even throw these questions over to the other guys if you've got anything else to to add to anything that Marcus is um uh Marcus has not covered or or other things that you may see that uh that get missed or typ typical thermal bridges that architects and designers generally ignore or forget about. Ben, what about what what about you? Yeah, I think my, um Mark's covered it pretty well. It, it's I'm trying to cast my mind back to our earlier projects, you know, because that's when we were, I guess, um, uncovering these thermal bridge details. And now it's kind of more commonplace for us to deal with it as part of our documentation package. So, um, yeah, I think the the window installations were probably um, less considered by us. I guess we were relying on um, certified products and had assumed that, you know, the wall build up and layers perhaps um, not as much of a component there. So, you know, when you take a certified window and put it into a different wall build up, perhaps a round earth wall or something like that, then you perhaps have a different thermal bridge assessment to conduct. So um, we've always lent on the certifiers very heavily for that kind of feedback and um, early engagement's the key. Brian, have you got anything to add to that? Uh, so the question was, what can be missed? Um, essentially, I would say collaboration is key here. Um, ideally, you try and get people that have already done it. If you can't, try and get people that can get on board as early as possible. Um, we all know, or most of the people looking at this will know what a thermal bridge is. Um, elimination is best process. If you can't eliminate, then you minimize. If you can't minimize, then you have to, you know, you have to increase insulation and you have to get rid of that thermal bridge, pulling it inside the structure and insulating outside, which is not ideal and it's a it's a tough way to do it, but. We all know that's a mesh between architecture and performance. So I would say collaboration, pack process, if you're a builder, if at all possible, um, if you're the architect, you need to have somebody involved that knows what they're doing, preferably a Passphos designer. Um, not necessarily the certifier at that stage. Um, the the Passphos designer should have enough information and hopefully should have enough um, in his library of detailing to come up with solutions for that. Uh, that's all I would say. Area collaboration is probably key here. I know in some of our first projects uh, when we were detailing around windows. Uh, it was one of the things that uh, we got tripped up on uh, on one project uh, that comes to mind where we actually didn't detail it uh, as per the drawing. So it's actually really important given that these projects do get tested and then certified and checked by a third party that 
you know, every detail that's on the documentation is adhered to. Um, Brian, I'm going to throw this one to you. Um, how do you start the passive house conversation with someone who doesn't know much about it, even if they've been in the industry for a long time? How are you selling passive house to, to people? Um, if you asked me that five years ago, I would have said shotgun approach. So you go out and you do the home shows and you do everything that you need to do and you're standing there. You're an alien, essentially. You've got a product that nobody believes in, nobody understands, and you're trying to push it out there. So for anyone that understands physics or understands engineering, then the numbers are the numbers. And, you know, numbers don't lie. Physics is numbers and it just doesn't lie. So we know it's foolproof. To answer your question, Hamish, um, most of the people that come to us now don't necessarily need to be sold. They've drunk the Kool-Aid or they've understood, you know, the intro to Passive House. When I'm catering to the masses or as I call it, the shotgun yeah. approach, it's in presentations. So you're pre presenting to uh, whoever it may be, whatever event it may be, if it's, you know, Sustainable House Day Week or Passive House Association uh, open days, or even like we go to TAFEs, we do our own open days, there's whatever it is, but you present the five principles and then you simplify that presentation from the five principles and as you make it as easy to understand as possible. Uh, essentially, the end product is a healthy living environment that's you know, cost effective to maintain the internal temperatures and it's um, hopefully better for the environment. At, at the end of the day, that's what you're not necessarily trying to, to sell. Ideally, we're always trying to sell because we all own businesses, but it's, it's more of a, a knowledge sharing is how I look at it. We're here to just share knowledge and to essentially get that knowledge out there to people and say, look, this is a product that is available. It is does work. We know what's involved. It's all about physics. It's all about whatever climate you're in. Um, and then you build according to that. So for me, it's it's more knowledge sharing than than a sales pitch, if you know what I mean. So, so to, to summarize, it's all about educating. Um, education, yeah, absolutely. Yep. It's, all, it's all about education. Yeah, yep. Um, Sven, you got anything to add to that? Yeah, one of the key things that we educate our clients on, typically, they, they are very aware of Passive House. They're often asking us for that. Um, a lot of people don't realise the superior build quality that you get and the longevity of that. You know, <clears throat> you, you're eliminating interstitial condensation from your fabric and therefore creating a building that's going to stand the test of time. And, and that addresses sustainability in a way that we just don't have in our um, NCC. So... For me, it just makes me feel good about the product we're delivering um, and, and yeah. hopefully, you know, clients usually grab onto that. They've got a healthy indoor environment. They've got a building that's going to last forever. Um, you know, it's kind of a win-win. Marcus, I've got a question for you about uh, PHPP. So for those who don't know what PHPP is, it's the Passive House Planning Package. Um, could you just explain to us what the PHPP is yes. and... Um, what kind of data you put in and then what kind of data it spits out. Yeah, sure. Yep, so PHP is the planning, the passive house planning package and it contains everything necessary for design and a properly functioning passive house. So the PHP prepares an energy balance and calculates the, the annual need demand of the building strictly using the, the laws of physics. So the actual PHP is based in Excel, so it's very accessible. Um, there's a number of different worksheets containing all the, the relevant inputs for various areas from geometry, shading, some performance of the envelope, film quidging, ventilation, all the heating flowing systems um, and so forth. Um, but because it's in Excel, you can make um, any changes instantaneously and compare and optimize buildings are so very easy for users to see that effect. Um, so yeah, it makes it it's very user friendly. Um, and so it's it's also very, very reliable. So it's been used on many thousands of projects around the world, and we're seeing a very, very small performance gap when we're looking at statistically large numbers of these projects. Um, so yeah, so it's validated, it's proven practice, um, and so we can use it as a designer to optimize our passive house buildings in different climatic regions, um, including Australia. Might have a so it doesn't, model. Marcus, it doesn't stand for please proceed with high performance. Oh, that's a good one. I like that. <laughs> hey, Sven, I'm going to throw this to you. It's a bit of a follow-up question with the PHPP. So uh, in your experience working with PHPP in pre-construction, 
Uh, how are you using that information, um, I guess, to optimise buildings with what like, what marketers were talking about before and, and how you then can present information to clients to show effect on costs to the actual build and cost of performance? Great question. Um, so I think over the years we've established a really good starting point where we kind of have a feel for the climate and what we need to do, but we do still get caught out with you know, projects where it's a, a less familiar climate for us and we have to you know, boost insulation levels and, and play with different shading techniques or glazing ratios and performances, et cetera. So having the PHPP there to um, push and pull data and, and play with the 3D form um, allows us to, you know, I guess, eke out the very best solution that ticks as many boxes as possible. Um, there's a scenario at the moment on a project where, um, you know, the shading wasn't considered as thoroughly as it needed to be early in that design development work. And so the building was initially performing very well. There were other design changes to reduce construction cost. And all of these things boiled down to a building that didn't comply and wasn't going to make performance without significantly boosting insulation levels, reducing thermal bridges, increasing shading. It was a, a challenging climate, admittedly, and we've got it over the line now, um, once Marcus gives me the nod at least. And then, uh, <laughs> and, and, you know, and, and that has played out to actually reduce construction costs at the end of the day. We, we've been trying to bring the cost down throughout all of this. So, um, you know, when you're problem solving and resolving solutions, it's, it's about understanding what have you got to achieve? What are your options out there? And, and which one's going to pick out the best result for everybody at the table? So having a builder as part of the project has been critical as well, because you can get that really good feedback on costs relatively quickly. So um, I'm not sure if I actually answered your question. I feel like I've Digress. No, you, 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 no, you totally did, but but I am going to throw it over to Brian, um, who's also a builder, but also a uh, passive house designer as well. So Brian, how do you use PHPP during that pre-construction phase to help uh, optimize the building from a cost and performance point of view? So full disclosure, I don't use PHPP. I pay somebody else to do it. So I, it it doesn't. Uh, I won't say it doesn't interest me. I, I like to do stuff that I'm challenged by. And that doesn't, I won't say it doesn't challenge me. I've no interest in doing it because there's other professionals that do that for a living and they love numbers and that's what they do. I love dealing with clients and I love building and I love the challenge of building. So I don't do PHPP. I know how the models work and I get the models and I review them. Um, KDG, Luke Kellett does all my modeling for me. Or yeah, I would say all of it at this point. Um, we've built up a library of details. But just for everyone out there that's looking at the moment, um, to just give you a little bit more information, the amount of information that's put into a PHPP is phenomenal. So everything from you start under the ground, if you insulate underneath your slab, your concrete, your perimeter insulation, your wall, your wall frame, your insulation, your wraps, your claddings, your battening system, your windows, your plasterboard, your ceilings, your roof, your fixtures, every single thing that you put into that house goes into that software. And every single thing that you put into that software has a number. It has a value, it has an energy efficiency level, it has a rating of some kind, be it a U value, a lambda value, whatever it is, an R value, it will have some form of performance attached to it to be able to go into that um, PHPP modeling. This is why the PHPP modeling is so good. So once you've got all of that, you can imagine you get all your materials and you chuck them in a bucket, and then inside that bucket, they all go where they're supposed to be magically in that software, and that software then spits out a number and tells us, right, this house will perform X. It's overheating because there's six western facing windows and they're 2.4 meters high and they've got no shading and their glazing is u value is 1.8 and the sSGC is 0.57 it's too high you're getting too much heat gain that, that software will tell us that so in a nutshell the PHPP has given us all of that information based on the information that we're putting in so if you put in crap product you will get a crap result essentially is where it's at so the better the product the better the knowledge of the person that's putting the product in, the better the result. So again, it comes back to collaboration. If you have a person that's doing your PHPP modeling and is familiar with the design plus the climate. So we, we've designed in six right through, right now we're doing one in climate zone one at the moment, which is, it's completely polar opposite to climate zone six. It's completely different, but it's the same process. You're putting the materials, 
and the products into the PHPP that is then giving you the information that you need to then say, right, well, this doesn't perform. We need to change that product, be it Windows, Glazing, whatever it is. And that's where the, the value add or the value engineering comes into play. If you need to change Windows, well, if we change them to this, how much are they? That's how much it costs. But without that PHPP modeling, you, I won't say you're flying blind, but you, you kind of don't know where you're going to land unless you, you plug in the information, you get the result, and then you find out where do we need to improve. In short, again, it comes back to collaboration. Well, for someone that doesn't like PHPP or like numbers, you've answered that incredibly thoroughly. Thank you, Brian. Um, ben, I'm going to throw this one to you. Um, so this is from uh, someone who's emailed uh, some questions through. So I've heard that building a smaller size active house is often more challenging than a big build due to the TFA, so it's got a floor area being so low. Obviously, it is generally more sustainable to build a smaller to build smaller. So have you got any tips on how to get certified with a very small footprint? Uh, okay, yeah, good. I'm glad we've done one of these. So <laughs> we did a small house uh, in country Victoria. It was a 64 square metre footprint um, with a loft space. So it's a certified passive house. It's an off-grid project. And um, our biggest concern with that was actually achieving the air tightness. So um, we were very lucky to have uh, great materials and products. Uh, we had Luke Plowman from Detail Green involved and in doing the blower door testing. And, and as a result, yes, the air tightness was the biggest issue. Um, and that's my understanding historically from passive house projects that the smaller the envelope, the harder it is to achieve your air tightness requirement. So um, the insulation levels, the, the fabric and the performance of that was all um, straightforward and no issues. So uh, that's the only thing I would sort of, I guess, flag as a concern for a small footprint. Do you want to just quickly touch on why it's harder to get to that 0.6 ACH in a smaller volume home than it is with a, with a bigger volume home? Volume home? Yeah, and, and my understanding of it is probably not as technical or as experienced as Marcus, so maybe he can follow on from me. But my understanding is that you've got, um, on, a, on a larger build, you've got the resistance of the air movement as such and the air molecules is aiding the performance. So um, you have less pressure on your fabric in a larger volume than you do in a smaller volume. But Marcus, I've probably got that all wrong. Can you clear that up? Yeah, um, I think it's 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 also like that that ratio. So it's a very small building. You have a very different ratio of, of external external um, surface areas to internal surface volume. So with a very, like the smaller you get, the 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 larger that ratio becomes. You have a lot more external area versus internal volume, and that kind of plays that makes it more challenging from air tightness, but also because when we look at air tightness, we're using our ACH, which is the air volume, internal air volume um, changes, but also for um, just the heat loss and heat gain as well, because we're looking for our metrics for um, heat demand and cooling demand is all reference to the TFA. So the, the smaller amount of TFA we have for the surface area, that, that also makes it more challenging. So the smaller we get, the, the more we need to increase our thermal performance. So it does play against much smaller buildings, but um, but it also makes sense because you have that more ratio, that greater ratio. Um, but at the same time, you have a more internal heat gains for that smaller smaller building as well. So that's going to help with the heating demand. Um, but yeah, it's it's totally possible, and you, you can definitely build smaller small projects. It might just need uh, to as a as a reference to a normal project to be a bit more airtight or per square metre of surface area, slightly more insulation per square metre of surface area. And yeah, that's a question, especially because yeah, you. we do want to build smaller and ideally with less materials as well and to build small as quite doing that. Awesome, thanks. Brian, I'm going to throw the next question to you. Um, so you're, you're on site, your home's under construction, everything's lining up in PHPP. Uh, so the building as, you know, designed could, you know, get 
through the certification process. Um, when on site, what are some of the things that you're doing uh, to make that certification process easier um, once you've completed the construction? Uh, first course of action is identifying the thermal bridges that have been completed in the PHPP modeling. That's the first thing you do. So you identify where they are and when they're going to happen so that you can record them. That's the first thing. The second thing is, and that's done before you go to site. And then the second thing is um, materials. You're going to have a list of materials which have been entered into the PHPP modeling. Again, as part of that process, you need to make sure that you can get access to those materials and they've been booked and scheduled. Um, and at the installation procedures, everyone understands what's going on with them. Now, if it's standard construction and you're doing over and over, this is not an issue. Um, I would say one of the biggest things is, again, education and knowledge to your trade base. So your suppliers, your trades, your professionals, anyone that's involved in the project, they need to understand and they need to know what they're doing, when they're doing it, and how they're doing it. That's the important part. And then and the kicker to all of that is why. They need to understand why they're doing it. You can't just tell people to do something and expect them to do without knowing the why. They have to understand why they're doing something. If they understand why, then they understand what and when. So the why is, for me, probably one of the most important things. So any trades that come on to us, we always send, we take them and have them at one of my sundowner events where I go through like a 40-minute presentation of Passive House and it goes through all the principles and why we do what we do um, in a house that is at lockup stage. So, you know, membranes are visible, window installations are visible, HRV is visible, so everyone has a look. Um, after that, I would say our process may not be like everyone's, but but we tend to use WhatsApp for everything. So there's a WhatsApp for every project, right? Now, everyone gets added to that project. Plumber, the Sparky, Chippies, whoever's on site, they all get added to this, and they just dump pictures in there. They're just dumping pictures constantly. Supervisors, everyone's dumping pictures into the WhatsApp. And then back in the office, scheduling, or whoever's in charge of those photos in that folder, takes those out and then logs them into the various folders. So in PHPP, Marcus, you can correct me on this if I'm wrong, but I think there's about 24 pages or 24 sections, and then there's sub subs of about 14. The 14 are the ones that require backup or pictures from site, usually. Um, those 14 are critically important. So when you record your information, you're recording them in the various folders so that towards the end of the project. So if you're looking for certification now, you probably should be doing it, you know, once you pour the slab, you should be recording it and sending it to the Marcus because he's that far behind at this stage. <laughs> it's going to take two years to get the certification. So you should be doing this as part of the process through the project. So at the end of the project, you're not just dumping all this stuff on the certifier and saying, here we go, we need certification, we want a plaque. You need to try and drip feed this information as you get it. Even if it's the, the designer, if it's the Passive House designer, and like how we normally do it is that there's a Passive House designer employed and then there's a certifier employed separately, but through the designer. And that works really well because they're, we're giving the information to the designer, designer's checking off that, making sure it's all okay. Then it goes to the certifier and we're getting double checks before it even goes to Germany. But the WhatsApp for me is the biggest thing. Like obviously your supervisor needs to know what he's doing, but the WhatsApp dumping pictures in, we use that. It's, it's sometimes it's a pain in the bum because you've got like 25 WhatsApp groups and it is like, sometimes it's painful, but when it comes to storing information, it's an absolute no brainer. Um, I just want to throw to Marcus really quickly. If you could just um, clarify to the, to the audience, the difference between in, in a, in a project, the passive house designer and the passive house certifier and their roles in that project. Well, hey Brian, I just want to add that that WhatsApp group. I, I love that idea. I think that's that's fantastic. We'll have that and, and keep that and keeping everyone accountable. Um, yeah, so the full passive house designer. So they're 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 engaged by the client as well, both as Brian mentioned, both the certifier and designer engaged directly by the client. The designer's role is to maintain the passive house planning package and to directly input their design um, and correspond with the architect and all the, the, the consultants and any um, so, yeah, structural, um, like, um, electrical, mechanical, so all those trains, all the, the consultants they're communicating with and it's making sure that they understand what clients needed for passive house and their Working through that, and then you sign them up with some updates to the de to more detail or design. They're um, incorporating that into the modeling so that we can include film bridge modeling or uh, correlating that with evidence. Um, 
And then at three different stages, um, the certifiers generally involved. So they'll, the certifier would uh, review it three different packages, uh, the initial initial design to make sure that all the all the assumptions are reasonable and there's not uh, yeah, not too many things that need to be flagged. Um, then before construction, they would do another check and make sure that all the components um, all the details have been thoroughly uh, inputted and everything is okay in that regards. And then the certifier will generally submit um, like a pre construction approval letter to say to the client, hey, yep, this is all within good. There's no issues here and you can proceed with construction. And then right at the end of construction, the certifier will do a final check once they've um, viewed all the commissioning documents, blow it all tests, any other changes to the design. Um, and the construction managers decoration as well. Um, yeah, and this, that's generally like the flow of information. So go through um, the architect, all the, the engineers going to the task house designer with the certifier. And once the certifier has ticked off on everything, then it will go to PHI for the final um, tick. And then the certifier would issue a certificate to the client. Awesome. Pam, thanks, mate. Can, can I Yo. just add one thing there, Hamish? Sorry. Sure. Um, when we were talking about recording information and stuff like that, if you're a builder, buy a blower door. If you're getting down the rabbit hole of Passive House and you are a builder, buy yourself a blower yeah. door and go get the training. It will save you so much time and money. It's I can't stress it enough. We got our first one back in 2014, uh, I think. We've done hundreds and hundreds of tests, hundreds of tests. But when you're looking for that 0.24 or whatever it is, or 0.01, and you have to call in somebody to do a test every time you're testing. A, it's going to cost you a lot of money. And B, it's the wrong way to do it. You, when we do air tightness, we will do the, we'll tighten up the building, put all the windows in, put all the membranes on, put all the services in. And then what we do is usually we won't even test the building. We will put the fan in the door, all the windows and doors closed for one day. And we'll send a couple of apprentices around for a day, fault finding. Just one day. That's all we do. And then we'll test it at the end of that first day. And whatever that result is, if it's not certified passive house, we're looking for under three, which is, you know, that's in our contract. If we hit under three, we're more than happy. Um, they're usually under one. It's very seldom we go above one. But that for me in itself, just the cost alone associated with having your own blower door and just putting it in the door and fault finding for that one day to get that result, buy a blower door, get the training. It's worth every penny. I'll just, just add to that. Yeah, I think it's so... Um, yeah, I highly recommended that the builders have their own blower door. Um, yeah. Just that when it's for certification, it has to be someone independent of the construction team who takes regards that that final um, final blower door test for certification, just to make sure yeah. it's all independent. So we can't test. I, I don't know if you're going to go through this later on, but we can't test for certification ourselves. It has to be an independent party. But we will test that lockup. We will test after Giprock, we will test after cabinetry, and then we'll test again a couple of times before we come to the very end, just to make sure that we're in line. But there's a couple of critical points there where you test along. And that's, it's really just accountability on trade. So we know that, you know, after Giprock, they're probably the highest probability of, of making a mistake or making a fuck up, excuse the language. Um, and that's why we test after Giprock. And then again, after cabinetry, because they're screwing through the Giprock, there's a chance they might hit a pipe or they might hit something else. And we test again then. But yeah, like I said, going back, buy a blower door if you're a builder. Good advice. Um, hopefully you have your shares in uh, the blower door company, Brian. Uh, yeah, I'm going to throw this one to you as well, Brian. Um, and it's probably uh, in line with something you just touched on before about the some of those ACH targets that you're, that you're trying to hit. Um, what are you finding people are putting into their contracts regarding passive house? Uh, so are there special conditions in your contracts that you're saying that you're going to meet certain sort of air uh, tightness levels? Not in my contract. In my addendums, yes. Uh, passive house principal projects will all be under three. We'll put that in because we know you, get, you still get very high efficiency with your heat recovery ventilation system at three. Anything above three, then your 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 efficiencies drop off very very quickly in the heat recovery ventilation system. Um, we know that code. I think we we keep going over and back about this. I think they're going to settle on six, is the is the number. And then uh, I was with a, a large architectural firm yesterday who were doing a, a pilot project here in Perth, and we were going through detailing for air tightness and and WRB systems, and their target's going to be five. 
Um, so the industry is probably sitting around the five, six mark for entry, but they're not looking at passive house. They're just looking at uh, Green Star at the moment. So you get accreditation for Green Star and commercial buildings by having a, uh, an air tightness result of five or less. So that's what they're looking for there. In the residential industry, it's not in there yet. In our particular contracts, like I said, it's not in the contract. If it's in a certified passive house, yes, it's 0.6 or less. Um, but in our addendum, which is part of the specification uh, paperwork on the project, that'll say three air changes or less. Can I clarify that with you, Brian, please, quickly? Um, mm -hmm. So are you saying that you'll, if you're doing a certified passive house, you'll stipulate the um, separate criteria for passive house within the contract, or will you just no. say in your contract that you will deliver a certified passive house, full stop? You just deliver a certified passive house. So yeah. as part of the contract, you'll have the certification process in there. Mm. So you'll have the certification process, the yeah. PHPP modeling, all of that design pH work and everything that goes into that, including the cost for certification, will be included in the build contract. Unless you do a design contract first and it's included there, it's separate, but it's still part of your contract works. Like if, if you're doing a if you're building a house and it's a certified passive house, somewhere in that contract it's gonna say it's a certified passive house. It has to. Yeah. Or I'm not sure how good the contract is. So Nick Finn, are you are you putting are you finding that the contracts for your certified projects are stipulating certification criteria in the contracts? Uh, no, no, they're not. And and I just I thought Brian had inferred that in what he was saying. That's why I clarified. I, I perhaps just wasn't listening closely enough. But um, we have had a project. Interestingly, it's now completed. It's been certified. We just um, it'll be it'll be published soon, but. The building surveyor or certifier, whatever you call them, actually put certified passive house into the um, building permit documentation. And so they wouldn't release the CFO until the building had been fully certified. And so that put a lot of pressure onto what Marcus it was in the end and, um, and also the PHPP designer oh. to get everything polished up and finished very efficiently so the clients could get their CFO. Wow. Well, I actually don't awesome. mind it, to be honest with you. It's the first time it's ever happened, uh, but I know a lot of builders would be very adverse to that. I'm not going to comment. I remember, do remember happening that happening. It was a bit, you know, the designer was definitely a bit stressed trying to get that through quickly for the, for the client. And um, all sorts of rabbits out of hats. Mm -hmm. It was incredible work by, by you and him. I'm mm -hmm. um, just quickly on the, the air changes with like NCC. So the NCC, 2022 for commercial buildings that states that if you go down uh, per, um, performance solution for air tightness and if you hit an air, air permeability less than five then you must have a mechanical ventilation installed. so I just thought that's worth uh, so I expect that'll probably be the same for residential projects in the next um, version yeah, yeah it is it's, it's in for commercial and it's in 2025 for residential yeah. Well, that's the expectation, but um, most commercial buildings are mechanically vented at it anywhere. It's irrelevant. Like they put it in there, but I don't think it matters. Um, Sven, I'm going to throw this one to you, mate. Um, do you ever go back to your previous passive house projects to see how they're performing? Have you had the opportunity to go back and, and experience one years down the track? Uh, yeah, not to sort of live in or, or stay in, but we certainly have visited a few of them over the years. Yeah, yeah. And um, we recently interviewed uh, one of our past clients for a house we did in the Dandenong Ranges. Uh, it looks like a big black tube. And that um, that wasn't a certified passive house, but it was almost. And, um, and so we did conduct an interview with him to sort of really dig into that and, and find out, you know, have they, you know, it's been six years he's been living there. Has he noticed any health changes, anything different in their life? What about their guests? Have they noticed the difference? It was a really interesting conversation. We've been slowly drip feeding bits and pieces out of that onto our social media platform. But um, everyone that we've spoken to retrospectively and visited have all commented on, on the comfort first and foremost. Just stop on that. I'm sorry. No, I was going to say, we've experienced the same thing with um, our past clients as well. No, at Hippie Height, we've been trying to, like, in our developments, we try and do a lot of monitoring of how they're performing. Um, so that's something we, we're trying to do in some of the, if, if, yeah, when we have clients that are interested, get some sensors in there, get pull out the, 
the actual energy consumption, real energy consumption, and compare that with the PHP, because I think that's it's really powerful to have that information for Australian projects. There's a lot of that information over in Europe, but not too much of that yet for Australian projects. So we're really I'm trying to be pretty keen to get some of those comparisons for us. I'm going to try and jump into some of the questions that have come up um, while we've been having a chat. And there is a little bit of an overlap uh, in some of the ones we've got previous. So I'm actually just going to throw this out to, to any of you because um, I know that it's something that Sven and I have chatted to, chatted about in some projects that actually didn't get to site, but it was an NFIT project. And it's um, what are the key challenges in trying to achieve NFIT certification for a double brick house? Go, Marcus. <laughs> um, I, I worked as a designer on a project that was that was doing this, and if it's a case of a brick house, and the, the it depends on which uh, I guess which way you're trying to achieve certification is either the energy performance or the, the component method. A component uh, is I think a bit easier because it's more relaxed around the fabric, but the the you have to have really high performing windows. And how you install those windows in the wall, really, it does impact the overall window performance. So it's really one of the key challenges was trying to get a window installation that would get the, the total U value to comply with the NFIT um, limit. Um, and then and other parts of it was just making sure that you uh, look at all those junctions that we're talking about with NFIT projects and can be quite challenging, the airtightness. Um, but yeah, that, that window performance was one of the key challenges that, that I found as a designer on, on that specific project. Um, for those who don't know what an NFIT project is, Ben, do you just want to maybe just quickly touch on the difference between, say, a passive power classic and an and a NFIT project? Oh, in simple terms, NFIT relates to uh, renovations and, and alterations and additions to projects. So, um, and there's slightly different, no, slightly different metrics that need to be hit um, yeah, across the right. between the two. It's a little bit more relaxed for uh, retrofitting, but I think um, I think NFIT renovations is going to be a big part of the market moving forward. Well, hopefully, anyway, given that we've got these lots of old building stock that uh, rather than pulling it down, we should we should be renovating it. Um, Sven, mm -hmm. I'm going to show this one to you too, mate. Um, should all projects be tested for future climate risk? What an ambiguous question, but I'm going to get you to give us your best answer. Uh, should they be tested for future climate risk? Yes. Yeah, sir. okay. I, I, look, ultimately, I don't think it's hard to do. You know, whether you're using NATERS or PHPP, you can do that. Um, I guess at the end of the day, the question probably means then, what do you do about it? And what's the implications of it? So let's say you um, you use the CSIRO climate files or you use the PHPP climate files for future climate um, and you get the results out of that information. What do you do with that information? How do you act? You know, and so we, we've got a big jump at the moment trying to get people to build these high performance passive house homes that are you know, uber high quality. And there's a cost jump perhaps for some people, depending on where you're coming from. So then if that means you still want to achieve that passive house criteria in the future climate, well, does that add more cost to your project or what, what does that mean and what do you do? So it's a really interesting question. I'd, I'd like to think we should because I want our building stock to last the test of time. I want it to still be here in 100 years instead of building homes that last 15 or 20 years and get bulldozed again. So from a sustainability perspective, I'd like to think we would do that. It's almost uh, the topic of a, a, an entire webinar, that question, I reckon. <laughs> we could probably sit there, unpack it for well over an hour. Um, Brian, I'm going to throw this next question to you, mate. Um, how many times do you go to site during the construction process to cross-check everything is being built as per the drawings and, I guess, the PHPP analysis? Uh, before I go into this, I'm just going to comment on your last one. Uh, planning to fail is failing to plan, or failing to plan is planning to fail, essentially. We should be building uh, higher performing homes, less carbon footprint, less operational energy, and then we don't need to plan for future climate because we haven't fucked it up. Like, <laughs> I don't mean to be crude, but <laughs> it's that simple for me. Do the right thing now so we have a future planet that we don't have to plan for catastrophe. 
if we do the right thing now, then you know maybe we don't have to worry about future planning. Maybe just a thought. When I'm when I'm when when I when I when I market this webinar later on, I'm just going to take that and grab and have that running in our social media. Brian, I think that was brilliant. Hold well on. And then, and then zoom in on Marcus's safety vest in the back background, yeah. and there is no plan yet to be. No, there's not. Mm. Um. All right. So how often do I go to site? As often as needed. So um. Um. As often as is needed. That is the answer to that question. It could be daily. It could be twice a week. It's at least twice a week, but it could be daily. It all depends on what stage of project project is at. If we're at framing stage and the guys are putting the roof up, well, there's no details there. Like everything's internal of the the thermal envelope. So as long as they put the roof on and it meets, like once the roof is on and I go and check it for AS um 1684 and you know for structability because that's my liability under as a builder, then it's fine. But yeah, the the, the devil's in the detail again. I'll be on site as often as I need to be to check those details and make sure they're recorded. If I see a few days with no, you know, no pictures going up in WhatsApp, I'll start to get a bit quizzy and send a message. Why is there no pictures? What's going on there? You know. In regards but, yeah. to that that topic too, Brian. If I can, sorry, if I've yeah, got you, okay. I wanted to add to that. Um, I think it's really important for people who are wanting to certify a passive house, and this is one of their early projects or first projects in doing it. Uh, an important thing would be to involve the team as much as possible, as early as possible, as Brian alluded to earlier, but also um, your passive house designer should be doing site inspections, if not your architect, to ensure that the details are being followed and adhered to. You know, we've had projects where we've walked onto site, we're not doing the contract administration work, but we've come to have a look and see how it's going. And we've noticed that the frame isn't overhanging the slab by 40 mil for the you know, slab edge insulation to tuck up under or you know, something hasn't been built properly. We've had to change details and then go back to the passive house designer and go back to the certifier and it opens up a can of worms. So invest in getting the inspections done to make sure that everyone's following the plan. That's what the drawings are. They're a plan. For an inexperienced team, absolutely. If you have, mm, yeah. like our designers included in the app, in the WhatsApp, he's getting yeah. all those pictures. So if there's something there, he'll twig it straight away. Um, if I just pop back, sorry, Ham, uh, the question you asked earlier about previous clients, uh, going back to previous clients. So I do it all the time and we do data logging on houses for one calendar year just to see how they're doing. But jump on YouTube. There's there's six interviews I've done, four certified passive and two non-certified. They're worth having to listen to. They're, they're full interviews, like they're about an hour long or whatever. They were done for Sustainable House Day a few years ago. But that's a couple of years after people moved in. So they're probably worth a listen. And is that uh, through your own YouTube channel or on a... How can people find that one? Man, I'm a, I'm a dinosaur with this stuff. I don't know. I just do it and give it to somebody. And yeah, it's somewhere there on YouTube. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, I'd, I'd like to start putting the show notes, but I've got no idea how to do that either. So I won't get Isabella to see if we can find <laughs> I'd it. say it's probably under iSmart YouTube, <laughs> I, I would imagine. I don't know, but I'd say so. Yeah, uh, probably a, a comment that's been made before about, I guess, not building to uh, the design. Uh, this is another question we felt. I'm actually going to open it up to everybody because I think everyone can have some input into it. Um, how do you deal with changes to the design during construction? And does the PHP need to be updated accordingly and throughout the whole um, construction process? I'm happy to take that one. Yeah, Marcus. So, yes, absolutely. We need some record of how it's been changed because that's that's the whole certification process for we're kind of proceeding from you know we're planning we need to check this plan and make sure that the, the building actually is built as per the design um and so we we need some way of tracking those changes and making sure that if they are impacting the thermal bridging or impacting air tightness that we have considered that and and it's been reviewed and and uh, those changes have been assessed so um but yeah we do acknowledge that they this happens on the construction site um and you know that's not an evil in itself but we do need to to make sure that it's being considered where it needs to be Ben, do you want to add anything to that one no no i think it's i think it's covered off you definitely got to you've got to address it as you go i remember doing the ph designer course and we were we were taught by an Irish guy to do it manually on the fly, you know, walk out to site and you see that insulation's been missed somewhere and how do you compensate for that in the next layer or the next component? And we had to do the manual calculations around that in our class. It was incredible. I could not do that now. But, yes, at the time, that was an important lesson. 
and and I, I can actually speak to the importance of doing that uh, and the impact that it can have on certification. Uh, we've recently had one of our projects certified. It was a project we did do with Master Design. Um, during the construction, we changed windows from one UPVC window to another, and uh, these particular windows didn't actually perform as well as the ones that were in PHPP. Um, so we just prepped outside of uh, PHI Classic, a uh, passive house classic, and went into PHI Low Energy. Um, so it is absolutely critical. Um, and if people can learn from you know the, our mistakes uh, during that construction process, and I guess our inexperience at that particular time, um, you know, hopefully everyone else can then sort of learn from that and then not make that same mistake. But it does have a a massive impact on the performance or the you know the certification criteria. Yep, we had the same thing. We changed. So the first certified passive house we did, and this is a very, very common thing. So the shopper door from the garage to the house, solid timber door for security. We got the first one from a supplier that had all the information that you could just plug into the PHPP. The second passive house we did, the cert second certified one, that door for some reason was sourced elsewhere, and we had no information for that. You'll remember this, Marcus. We went through a lot of... It would have been yeah, just... cheaper and quicker to take that door off and go get the proper door and put it back on again. It would have been quicker. Only the client had moved in at that stage and we were in the final throws. And it was only when we put that information in and we tweaked that, hang on, this is a different door. And it's just a door. It's just a timber door. But that's how, that's how good this information is in PHPP. Yeah, that causes a bit of a headache, that one. Um, this is a, a we'll, we'll probably another couple of questions to get through before we, we need to wrap things up. So if anyone does have any more questions, please pop them in the chat. Um, I guess we're going to put that to, to all of you. Um, how can builders make benefit projects a viable business proposition, given that existing building stock may have so many unknown problems that will need to be solved to achieve the required building standard? Product. We need better products. Australia is still in its infancy and we don't have the product range that Europe has. That's the short answer. So if we had a better product range, we could do a lot more with existing stock. At the moment, we don't have the stock. We, we don't have the product range. If we start to import those product range, we soon find out very quickly to achieve and fit, it becomes non-financially viable. That's mm -hmm. our issue. It is cheaper to bulldoze it and start again when you actually, we've done this a lot. We've looked at it so much. It is extremely difficult in existing stock. And it's because of the way existing stock is built. Unfortunately, it's, it's, it's a big challenge because we know, like I would be wealthy right now if I had a solution for this because existing stock think, is where it's at. Do you think, Brian, given your building in Perth that is typically double brick, um, do you think there'd be a difference if you had, you know, like how we would put a lot of our homes out this way, having brick veneer with a timber frame. Do you think there'd be a different approach then? Uh, possibly, the yeah. Scenario? Possibly. Like at the end of the day, you still got a wall structure and you still have windows. So the windows you can get past. The wall structure is, is the issue. So here we know we've got double brick and it's a 50 mil cavity. So it's a huge amount of thermal mass with a tiny cavity. We need to separate that cavity, and it's just too small. So no matter what insulation you put in there, it's not enough to bridge the cavity. So you end up with either trying to insulate on the internal, which creates all kinds of problems with thermal bridging on the windows. Where do they go? And then if you insulate on the outside, you're looking at EPS, which is it's such a it's a high performing item, but it's, it's uh, yeah, it's just a bad product. Like I'm going to get in trouble for this again. I always do this, but yeah, the yeah, it's just it's not good for the environment. That's all. It's great insulator, but not good for the environment. So like on retrofit models, if we do enter fit out the back, we'll apply all the passive house principles and lightweight framing to the back. And then for the existing house, upgrade the insulation in the ceilings straight away. That's the first thing. Then secondly is the windows. And then that's the two most cost effective solutions you can do with the existing stock. Then try and seal as much as you can, which is very difficult, but you do the best you can with what you have. We've done one recently in Subiaco where we've pulled up all the floors and put floors down underneath and seal all around. And we, we did okay. We did all right with air tightness. Um, but the third one then is insulating the external walls themselves, which it just, it's a difficult one. So I know there's a guy here in Perth. He's just wrapped the whole external building in a timber frame um, and seems to be quite successful. Um, but we, we'll see how it comes out in the end. But I reckon it'll probably 
it'll probably be the first interfit in Western Australia. It's a ripper project. If uh, if if you don't already follow Matty Carlin from Carlin Construction, he's mm. actually got a retrofit project underway at the moment, and he's having um, some really great successes in turning an old shitty. Um, I'm not going to name the volume builder, but volume builder home into a really well performing um passive house market are you involved in that one yeah i am i'm I'm actually going out to site there next week as well super excited for it amazing no he's doing it he's doing an incredible job out there so definitely give that a follow and 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 follow along just just quickly Um, to add to the do you mind sorry yeah yeah absolutely go ahead um this is less i guess um in regards to benefit but also why more widely to other passive house types as well uh but yeah the value to the client um is that the building owner can actually be sure that the building will achieve and will perform in the way that is expected so you're getting that energy efficiency and that the investment in that better quality components will prove worthwhile so you can say okay you know, this is what it was through the modeling and it can show hey it's actually going to give us that 90 percent improvement in heating demand cooling demand um and then you can expect to get that the outcome of certified passive house so it's doesn't only feature supreme energy efficiency, um, but also optimal thermal comfort, very high degree of acceptance by users, permanent absence from structural damage and reliable in the future with increased temperatures. So I think that's the kind of value sell for that certification and that goes for benefit and other passive houses as well. Um, just a couple more questions here. Um, and this is from Kenny and it's just referring back to uh, insulating externally, Brian. Um, instead of XBS, could you apply Staco? So Staco is a is a brand for a wood fiber yep. uh, insulation. Um, I know we have explored that as an option on a project before, but there was concerns around there being a dew point in the mortar and the mortar lines. Um, Brian, have you got anything to add to that? Uh, fit for purpose. That's what this comes down to. And if you're a builder, you, you hold liability. Make sure your product is fit for purpose. Do your research. Like when you change a structure and you you start to make it a high performing home, you change the dynamics or the performance of that structure. In doing so, you change the dynamic of moisture passage through the structure, etc. You change the dew points. If you are doing something like this, A, get a woofy. Absolutely get a woofy. It's 1200 bucks and it's the best 1200 bucks. When it comes to liability, spend the money. After that, Again, go back to what I said earlier, availability of materials. If we had wood fiber that we could put on the outside of these buildings and render it and it would be a solution, then yes, we have a solution, but we don't have that, in my opinion, right now. We don't have a product that is suitable for that, that's fit for purpose right now. In my opinion, that's just my opinion. You brought up Wolfie just quickly, and I think it's probably one of the, we we might have touched on it previously, but can you just explain what a Wolfie analysis is for people who haven't heard of it before? Uh, it's a software package that carries out hydrothermal analysis on a structure or whatever structure you put into it. So it models climate data. You, similar to PHPP, you put in climate data for that certain area, and then it will model moisture passage or vapor passage through that what element of structure, whatever element it is. So be it cladding, um, ventilated cavity, membrane, structure, insulation, and then whatever your wall lines are on the inside, you, you put that information into the software. It then models moisture passage so basically humidity both sides in and out and then pressure pushing your moisture content through the wall or your vapors in and out through the wall and it does that over a 10-year period in that climate and then it will tell you your potential for mold growth or moisture inside the structure that that's essentially what Wolfie is it's a software package that does that so that analysis will tell you how your structure will perform be it a roof or a wall it'll tell you over 10 years in that particular climate your proposed wall structure how it will perform and where you have a dew point or a potential for mold growth in that structure. Is that right? Again, it's probably a whole other webinar. Um, and yeah. I think we have done some podcasts on on the Wolfie. Look, we've probably got time for one more question, Marcus. We know you've got to go. Um, and this is directed to you, mate. So um, you have been doing some studies with mass timber products. Um, how do they perform in a passive house? Yeah, so it's actually I was pretty much solely looking at the hyperthermal performance of it, specifically in tropical climates. Um, so looking at, okay, um, how do we design and optimize that assembly when we're in those hot climates and what we need to do is make sure that building is still operating um, in long-term moisture safety. Um, so yeah, using Wolfie a lot there. And um, I think yeah, the kind of out, 
results that I found from, from the thesis was um, in those really hot humid climates, the, it might sound intuitive when you say it, but the, the moisture is on the external side rather than the internal side in heating dominating climates. So therefore you actually want the air tightness and vapor tightness membrane on the external rather than the internal, as well as the in the insulation rather having on in the on the external, you actually want the insulation on the internal. Because that way your insulation layer, or the structural layer, being the CLT in that case, um, stays on the warm side. So you, um, it's kind of reducing that that moisture risk. It's a very, very specific niche of, of that. Um, but yeah, also just keeping that structure super, super dry during construction. So yeah, looking at strategies that you can employ on the construction site. And there's many, uh, but making sure that, you know, you have a list looking at the weather, um, looking at taping it and whether it's the membranes over the, the construction duration, and looking at how you can sequence construction as well to minimize any uh, moisture risks. So yeah, really interesting insights there. CLT. We might have we might have to get you back on to uh, have a <laughs> mini webinar on on that uh, on that study. Um, I'm going to wrap it up, guys. Thank you so much for coming along today. You guys definitely are uh, some big brains when it comes to passive air certification, and and hopefully we have been, uh, well, we have it has been beneficial for people who are, I guess, exploring certifying uh, their homes. Um, Again, thanks everyone for joining us this evening. Uh, a big thanks, thanks again to our one of our platinum sponsors, Thermatech. Uh, don't forget to check out uh, the latest episode uh, of our podcast, The Sustainable Builder Jack, with Dom and Brian catch up with sustainability consultant Craig Harris. Um, we have a heap of cool stuff happening this year with SBA. Uh, from the webinar side, keep a look out for some mini episodes. We're going to be featuring some cool, relevant supplies and products. Uh, these episodes will be between 7 to 15 minutes. Uh, they're just going to be nice little bite-sized pieces of information that can kind of fill in uh, the time between our monthly webinars. Um, these are going to be pre-recorded and they're going to be posted to our YouTube channel and sit on our website, so www.thesba.com.au. Uh, and that sits alongside all of our podcasts and a heap of other amazing information. Next month, we're going to be joined by Derek Layfield from DuraPanel. And I'm super excited to chat with Derek because he is an incredibly passionate and uh, amazing human being who's developed a really great product uh, that's using a waste product and turning it into a really sustainable um, building product. Um, thanks again for joining us today. And I'll get this recording up onto a YouTube channel soon. Uh, guys, thanks again for joining us and we'll, we'll catch you all soon. Thanks, Thanks so much. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Thanks, Brian. Thanks, Thanks all. Cheers. Cheers.